Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Chris O'Brien. I'm the state political reporter for ABC TV News in Brisbane. It's my pleasure to be your MC today and on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland and the Queensland Tourism Industry Council, welcome and thank you for coming to this event where we'll hear from the Honourable Senator Erica Betts on the future of fair work in Australia. In just a few minutes, I'll uh, introduce Stephen Tate from the Chamber to get the ball rolling, but just to let you know that after that, he'll introduce Daniel Geschwind, who will then introduce the Senator. We'll hear from the Senator for about 20 minutes. After that, the Senator has agreed to a Q&A session, so that'll be your chance to employ your questioning techniques. You can either choose some Dorothy Dixes or some opposition questions, take your pick. As a journalist, I'd prefer if you did opposition questions, but that's perfectly uh, your choice. Then we'll have some lunch, and then after lunch, we'll have a, a panel discussion, and we'll introduce those panelists then. So thank you once again for coming. It's uh, great to see you all. Would you please welcome uh, the uh, Chamber boss, Mr. Stephen Tate. Well, good afternoon and welcome uh, to today's lunch. Feel free to carry on eating as I give a, a very brief introduction. Don't let me hold you back from your food. Um, it's a real pleasure to actually have you all here today to discuss the future of fair work. And I'd like to make a, a significant mention and a thank to the, the Honourable Senator Erica Betts, Minister for Employment, uh, for coming along today and actually standing up in front of our 200 people who are equally as passionate to hear your views on today's subject. I'd also like to acknowledge Daniel Geschwind, who's the CEO of, of QTIC, our partner today, whose members are equally as challenged as ours are with the current uh, workplace framework. As you know, workplace relations impacts on every business, in every region, in every category. And we feel that inaction is no longer an option in this area. Our economic prosperity is contingent on ensuring that we have the right workplace relations framework that's in place to meet the needs of the new modern economy, not just in Queensland, but in Australia. Our members, in fact, our Queensland employers, frequently tell us that Australian workplace relations laws have an absolute significant impact on their ability to be profitable, productive and competitive. Yet so often these concerns are ignored, indeed rejected by those that have the power and the responsibility to make amends to these laws. We believe this is wrong. For too long, governmental approaches have been seen through the lens of either political or ideological frameworks. We can't continue to have this continued in action. Whilst we're one of the nation's strongest economies, we're not actually immune to the global softening economy. The daily struggle of our members and small businesses is not helped by rigid, inflexible laws. They seek to apply a one-size-fits-all approach to many diverse businesses. It simply doesn't work. Since the commencement of the Fair Work Act in 2009, CCIQ and QTIC have been very proactive in trying to find out what is the right approach, what are the right uh, amendments that need to be made that frees up and encourages the growth in the economy. But one of the key findings, as I say again, is clearly it's not working currently. Today's event, in partnership with QTAC, commences that conversation. We see it as an opportunity to start a discussion and a debate around the outcomes that we need as an industry, as an industry body, and on behalf of our members, to actually help drive the economy. As the Minister for Employment, the Senator is uniquely positioned to provide the answers to many of the questions we may have here today, and that what we would need to see change under the coalition. Today we wish to discuss the future of the fair work under that coalition and hear firsthand what we, are expect, we seem to expect over the next three years and beyond. This event is crucially timed with the release of the terms of reference for the Productivity Commission review. This event underpins the way forward for putting in place a system that gets the balance right that, that benefits both employer and employees. The time for change has truly arrived. And we're calling on the federal government to take the strong and decisive actions to undertake the reforms that are necessary to boost workplace productivity. This is a change that our members and small business throughout Queensland and Australia need, and they need it now. So 
I'd like to hand over to our, our partner today, which is QTIC, Daniel Gershwin, who's now going to introduce the, the senator. Thank you very much for coming along this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the debate as much as we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, and ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce not only a very interesting and obviously popular speaker, the, the event has been a, a sellout, but also uh, a topic, I guess, that as Stephen said, is very dear to all our hearts and very dear to our industries. The speaker today is um, not only the senator or a senator for Tasmania, uh, a role he's taken on just over 20 years ago, which incidentally makes him not, by far not the oldest uh, representative in the Senate, but uh, I think it's about the third longest serving. So congratulations on a, on a proud record in, in Parliament and in the Senate. Uh, he's been elected three times to that position after initially being appointed to it and, and uh, re-elected several times, obviously with the endorsement of the people of Tasmania. So congratulations on that. Now, since uh, last year, uh, September last year, I believe, uh, the Senator is the leader of government in the Senate, a very important role uh, and a very prestigious role, and obviously an endorsement by the government itself uh, for the ca capabilities of the Senator. He's also the Minister, uh, very importantly, the Minister for Employment, and also the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Public Service. We are very interested in the role that the Senator plays in those capacities. It is very important for us. We're very active as an organization with the CCIQ at the federal and state level, and we formed indeed a partnership with the state government, with the Department of Justice and Attorney General, to advance uh, the understanding of what is at stake here and uh, advance an understanding of how we could tackle the many issues that we do face. So Senator, we're very keen to work with you and with your government and achieve great outcomes and bring the um, the interests of our industry and our organizations, the CCIQ and QTIC, to bear on your work. So we're ready to hear from you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Senator, the Honorable Eric Abetz. Thank you very much, Daniel. You uh, indicated that this function was a sellout. I hope that when you leave this afternoon, you don't think that I'm a sellout. Whilst it's, already been, whilst it's already been some six months uh, since I became Employment Minister, I thought I would uh, start at the very beginning. And the very beginning for me was a very keen interest in the space of employment and workplace relations, as a result of which I was foolish enough many years ago to put my hand up as a junior minister in the Howard government to represent workplace relations in the Senate and I've been doing so uh, now for some considerable period of time. I can also indicate to you that, uh, and you might want to question my sanity in relation to this, but employment is in fact my portfolio of choice. It is one that I have been interested in for some considerable period of time. And the reason is that it is a dynamic cocktail of social and economic policy. It's a cocktail of macro and micro policy having to work together to achieve outcomes. Some of you may previously, or may know that previously, I was known as the Shadow Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Thank goodness they cut off the shadow bit of my title, but the Prime Minister has also cut off and workplace relations. Not that I'm not responsible for it, but he wants, as do I, to have the whole emphasis on, not with respect, massaging the differences between employer groups and employee groups, but focusing on employment. What do we need to do to create employment within our country? And by employment, I mean having meaningful, rewarding employment opportunities for Australian citizens. The social data is devastatingly clear and it's common sense as well. You don't really have to think about it, but 
every now and then we do have to be reminded of the fundamentals and it's good when the social data and the research confirms that which we think is common sense. And it's this. Somebody that's got a job usually has a better mental and physical uh, characteristics chart. Their well-being mentally and physically is just so much better. Their self-esteem, their self-worth, the educational achievements of people within their household likely to be so much better than in those households where there are people without employment. So employment is vitally important from both a social and an economic perspective. Therefore, I hope you get the drift as to why the government decided that my portfolio should be entitled employment and why we make no apologies for deliberately pursuing a policy framework that is designed to create employment. We were left with a budget situation where the prediction was that unemployment would at least reach 6.25%. And so we are currently in a climate where it is anticipated that employment, unemployment will rise. From my perspective, uh, that is unacceptable. So what has the government done? In very brief terms, we have already sought to remove the carbon tax, to remove the mining tax, to remove red and green tape. We are now signing, we've signed up South Korea, now Japan with free trade agreements. We are trying to get the budget back into shape. We have uh, restored live exports. We have signed off on $400 billion worth of projects with the requisite environmental approvals, all of which had been previously log jammed. And so that's in a whole host of other portfolio areas that all designed to drive and create the economic well-being that then allows employment to uh, grow. Now, specifically to my portfolio area, can I waive the policy, 38 pages of policy that we took to the last election, which we announced well and truly in advance of the election for people to go through it, comma and full stop, every single letter and word, and make a determination for themselves as to what they thought of our policy. Nothing to hide out there in the open for all to see. I suspect, unless you're a real tragic, you would not have read all 38 pages, so allow me to give you a brief summary. We did promise that within the first week of the Parliament sitting, we would introduce legislation to reintroduce the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission. We did so, and can I thank the Public Service for their wonderful work in achieving that outcome. In relation to the Australian Building and Construction Commission, you have here in Queensland, regrettably, examples of why we do need the reinstitution of that uh, organisation. You've had the Queensland Children's Hospital situation, Indrapilly, you've had other situations where clearly the unions have been behaving in a manner that we would find unacceptable in every other walk of life. If we are a civil society, then one suspects that the rule of law should apply. But for some reason, for too long in Australia, the view is that somehow if it's an industrial site and more importantly, if it's a construction site, somehow the rule of law should not apply. Well, as far as this government is concerned, the rule of law should apply everywhere, including on industrial sites and construction sites. So we've got legislation to reintroduce the Australian Building and Construction Commission. We got it ready, regrettably, it has stalled in the Senate and the Labor Green Senators voted it to go to one Senate committee, now to another Senate committee, and they are simply seeking to delay. In relation to the Registered Organisations Commission, that is designed to ensure that those that are entrusted with the opportunity 
of looking after their fellow employers or fellow workers. So this is legislation that covers both employer and employee organisations, that those officials that are given the privilege of looking after their fellow members, that they behave with the same sort of responsibility that we expect from company directors. I don't think it's too much to ask that a company director should act in good faith with shareholders' funds. If a company director does not do so, he or she faces potentially a five-year period of imprisonment or up to approximately a $300,000 fine. Now, if you're a union official and you misapply, trying to use a neutral term, misapply members' funds, under the current regime, you face the princely fine of $10,000. We believe that given what we have witnessed with Michael Williamson, with Craig Thompson, the need for the Registered Organisations Commission should be there up in lights for all to see that if you misappropriate funds of members, then you should face the same sort of penalty as a company director. I can see and the government can see no material or moral difference between a company director misappropriating shareholders' funds or a union official misappropriating members' funds. We've also got the Royal Commission underway and today is its uh, first day of uh, public sitting. And it's one of those surprising things when I was asked this morning on uh, radio as to the need for this, I was able to refer to a former Labor Attorney General, a current Fair Work Commissioner, a former president of the ACTU and a host of union officials all saying that this Royal Commission was important and that they were willing to make a contribution to that Royal Commission with evidence. It is a matter of regret that the ACTU and the Labor Party are still opposing the Royal Commission, claiming it to be a witch hunt. Well, I'm sorry, but in some, what was it, 20 years ago, the Australian Workers' Union were the beneficiaries of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nobody knows where it went and there was a code of silence in relation to it. We have uh, just down south in Sydney in the, with the CFMEU an alleged or a uh, fund for drug and alcohol rehabilitation for the workforce. Supposedly it had about a million dollars in it. Money dissipated, nobody knows where it went. I would have thought an ACTU leadership of this nation should be condemning such activities and saying to the unions involved, clean up your act or you will be expelled. Instead, they come out and basically run a protection racket around these types of activities. And we believe that the union movement does, to be, does need to be cleaned up. And as I said before, we have the support of many people from the labour movement in relation uh, to those matters. And if you think that that isn't enough in relation to the first six months of government, we have also introduced the first tranche of our proposed amendments that we outlined in the Fair Work Amendment Bill. And allow me just to run through a few of the matters that we have uh, set out. First of all, changes to Greenfields agreements. Those, especially in the resource sector, would know that in trying to come to an enterprise agreement for a Greenfields project, the company can be held to ransom by a union saying, we will not sign up to something reasonable and they just basically uh, stall the project until they are able to extract wages that normally would not be paid. In other words, blackmail. As a result, what we have said is, and the new projects in this country are declining, we need to reinvigorate the resource sector. So we have said that if within three months the project and the union cannot come to an agreement on the enterprise agreement, the employer 
of their own volition can go to the Fair Work Commission and say that which we have put to the union is a fair and reasonable proposal and should be sanctioned so that the project can get underway. Our motivation for that policy was clear and simple. We want, we need more resource projects. With that, we will create more employment opportunities and greater wealth for our country. We've also uh, included in this bill changes to the right of entry provisions. Ms Gillard, when she was the shadow spokesman on workplace relations, promised the Australian people that there would not be any change to the right of entry laws. Well, we know now how wrong that was, how false that promise was. And huge numbers of changes have been made. And in short, we will be implementing Labor Party policy, which is to keep it as it was in 2007. We will also remove the lunchroom invasion, as we called it, where union officials can basically nominate the lunchroom now. In the past, employers and unions would have to work out where you would have the opportunity for union officials to meet with workers if they had the right of entry. Now the legislation says in default of agreement, it goes to the lunchroom. Guess how many union officials agree to any other facility other than the lunchroom? It becomes patently obvious why that change was made in the dying days of the government, along with their requirement that employers pay for the travel costs of union officials to get to a remote work locations. We don't believe that employers should have to bear the costs of union officials going about their work. If it is essential for them to get somewhere, then of course their membership should pay. So the right of entry laws are going to be changed. Individual flexibility arrangements, which were promised by Labor, but then closed down by various modern awards and enterprise agreements, we will free up to ensure that individual flexibility arrangements can actually be individual. It seems bizarre to me, and the logic fails me, that you can have an individual flexibility arrangement that needs to be sanctioned by 51% of the workforce. If it's going to be truly individual, then it should be something that the worker and the boss can decide upon, subject to that vital caveat that the worker is better off overall. We've also announced that there will be a Productivity Commission review, a root and branch review of the fair work regime. Vitally important that we have a proper independent review of the legislation. Normally, you have an impact assessment statement of any legislation. The Prime Minister of the day can say, not necessary, and in those circumstances, you have to have a review two years later. Well, that is exactly what Labor did with the Fair Work legislation. They didn't have a regulatory impact statement at the beginning. Then, after two years of operation, they set up a terms of reference which were completely skewed and got a few um, fellow travellers to undertake the review. Despite that, that review found many features within the Fair Work Act that needed to be altered. And we have adopted a lot of those in our policy and they are also part and parcel of our amending act that is currently before the parliament. But what we have said, and we said it at the time, the review should be undertaken as a root and branch assessment together with an independent body, hence the productivity review, a uh, productivity commission review. In the small business sector, we've already moved to do things that you would have thought any government organisation should want to do. And I refer to the Fair Work Ombudsman. We encourage them and they have now produced a document which says to a small business or a micro business, how do you go about engaging your first employee? You would have thought if employment is front and centre of a government's social and economic policies, then you might actually produce such a document. The good news is 
the Fair Work Ombudsman, has now produced such a document. They've also uh, established, courtesy of our policy, a hotline for small business, so small businesses can get quick access to advice from the Fair Work Ombudsman. And what's more, they now have agreed, and isn't that an interesting phenomenon, that you have to work these things through to get that agreement, that the advice they give you, you can actually rely upon and act. And I would have thought that that is something that should have been there quite some time ago. On the job services front, which is also in my uh, portfolio responsibility, that's the uh, people to whom we contract out to try to link unemployed people with jobs in the marketplace. Those contracts come up for renewal next year and we have indicated that we want a lot greater focus on outcomes rather than churn. We actually want outcomes for the uh, taxpayer's dollar. Can I conclude by making a call on the business community to show leadership in what is a very, very difficult space. And I do understand the difficulty. But today, can I invite you to look at the leadership shown by Grocon and shown by Borel, willing to take on the unions and say that illegality is illegality and you won't stand for it. That if you are being blackmailed, you won't quietly pay the money but you will in fact blow the whistle, call it for what it is, and say that behaviour has no place in workplace relations in the 21st century. And for those of you that aren't being blackmailed, please don't take advantage of those of your fellow businesses in the same space who are being blackmailed into deals to try to get a commercial advantage. Because at the end of the day, if you feed the crocodile, the only th reason you'd be feeding the crocodile is in the hope that you will be eaten last. It is neither smart nor ethically correct to behave in that manner. And so I take my hat off to Borel, to Grocon, and in fact a resource sector company that in recent times has agreed to back a smaller contractor who was being blackmailed in exactly that sort of manner and that company has said, you fight your battle, we will be with you, and when it's over, you've still got the contract with us, and we won't just discard you and move on to another contractor. It's that sort of leadership, it's that sort of camaraderie that the business community does need to show um, in this quite difficult time, especially in the construction and resources uh, area. So can I conclude where I began by saying that I see my task with changing aspects of the fair work framework and let's be clear, keeping the fair work framework, but we do believe a number of adjustments can be made and that is why we called our policy at the last election improving or the coalition's policy to improve the fair work laws and all that we want to achieve by making those changes is to create an environment where jobs can grow. And we know that jobs can only grow when you've got sustainable, viable, profitable businesses. It's only sustainable, viable, profitable businesses that can employ people, employ more people and pay good wages to people so that they can attend to their cost of living needs. That's the task that the government has set itself and uh, today I've been able to provide you with a, in effect, a six month report as to how far we've gone down the track. I would like to think we've achieved a lot, done a lot, but under absolutely no illusion that a lot more needs to be done. And with your help, I am sure that we can achieve the social and economic outcomes we need in the employment space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator.
It's your chance now, ladies and gentlemen, to ask the Senator some questions. We have a couple of microphones available to you, so just uh, if you have a question, put up your hand, state your name and, and fire away. But I will kick off by just asking you quickly, Senator, can you outline the time frame for the Productivity Commission review? Would you expect any uh, changes that flow from that to be in effect in this, change, in this uh, term of government? Look, uh, thank you very much for that question, and it allows me to clear up absolutely that the policy document that I waived just before is it for this term of government. The terms of reference, when they are released, will give the Productivity Commission, I assume, uh, about 15 months to undertake their task. Any recommendation that comes from the Productivity Commission will be considered by government and we will then determine that which we think is good and bad and, as you might imagine, take the good and that will be part of our policy platform for the next election and we would then seek a mandate for those changes in the 2016 election environment. Thank you, sir. Uh, a quick bit of housekeeping. I forgot to mention, if you need the bathrooms, they're down the other end of the corridor through the other brown doors. This section will go through to about one o'clock, so um, over to you, ladies and gentlemen. I think this gentleman here was first. Do you want to just wait for the mic, which James is uh, rushing to you? Uh, Minister Jason O'Dwyer from Master Electricians Australia. Um, one comment and one question, if I may. Um, the Fair Work Commission's website uh, also has a disclaimer on it that, uh, that employers can't rely on the information provided on that website in relation to uh, terms and conditions of the award and pay rates. Uh, it does cause concern for our members that uh, that legal uh, disclaimer is there. In terms of question, um, given the situation with the West Australian um, Senate committee, uh, so Senate election, um, a lot of members ask us, we are waiting for the Senate to change. Given the light of the uh, Western Australian election result as we know it at this stage, uh, how do you see that your plans will progress past July? Right, two, two aspects there. In relation to the Fair Work Commission, that is, if you like, uh, or the Fair Work Commission is an independent body, as is the Fair Work Ombudsman. And there is, from time to time, confusion in between, uh, between those two bodies, and that is why uh, it was my view that it should have been called the Australian Industrial Relations Commission rather than uh, this Orwellian name of the Fair Work Commission. But uh, believe it or not, we've got a few other things on our agenda rather than changing the name uh, at this stage. But there is confusion between the two. And in relation to the advice uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman provides, that is in relation to the oral advice that is given on the hotline. They now archive those calls. And as a result, if you can say that at you know, 1 p.m. on the 9th of April, you rang the Fair Work Ombudsman and you received such and such advice, they can go back, track that call, get out. And if that is what was said and they were wrong, they will accept that. Sure, the employee will still get their entitlements, but the small business in particular will not be a confronting uh, any prosecution in relation to having done the wrong thing, courtesy of uh, wrong advice. In relation to Western Australia, look, uh, I'm still um, keeping everything crossed that we might get the third Liberal senator up over there. And if that were to occur, and I'm not predicting it will, but if it were to occur, then it would in effect be a repeat of the 7th of September election result of three Liberal senators and one Palmer United Party senator. So uh, that would then be relatively situation normal, which of course gives us one extra <coughs> vote. And when you are dealing with a very tight Senate, every single vote, everybody in the chamber counts. Uh, if we are reduced to two and Labor are lifted from one to two, then of course our task is made so much more difficult. But if I might, without insulting anyone, and I've got to be very careful these days as leader of the government in the Senate, I see all senators as God's children, all to be loved, all to be looked after, all to be cherished. That's and why I was surprised when you said situation normal. You don't normally hear situation normal at the Palmer uh, Party. But if I might seek to describe most of the senators of the Palmer United Party, family first and the Liberal Democrat senator from 
New South Wales in general terms as representing the centre-right of Australian politics, uh, if I can be as bold as to do that, then I am relatively hopeful that things such as the carbon tax and the mining tax can be and will be repealed, that the Australian Building and Construction Commission will be re-established and that we will be able to get on with our agenda. Can I say at the moment, it's, I still refer to myself, to my colleagues, as leader of the opposition in the Senate. There was nothing changed after the 7th of September. The Green Labor majority still run the show, and as though nothing's changed, or if anything's changed, they show resentment to the decision of the Australian people on the 7th of September. So after the 1st of July, at least we're in there with a chance. And uh, that will be the task for myself and my colleagues to convince the independents and the minor parties uh, to consider our policies and if they are convinced to uh, support our policy platform. And I think most of them do respect that we did have a strong policy platform of stopping the boats. And that is why hopefully they will see the need to reintroduce temporary protection visas on which we campaigned and Labor and the Greens are knocking out in the Senate each time we try to put that regulation up and same with the carbon and mining taxes and the list regrettably goes on. Thank you, Senator. Next question, please. Serena Rosso from Serena Rosso Job Access. Um, welcome to Brisbane, Senator. It was a very powerful presentation. Uh, one of your um, targets is one million jobs within five years. This is a great opportunity right now. Uh, we have extraordinary employers here. How can we assist the government to achieve that target? And my second question is, how can we include and really make a fundamental focus on the youth? Thank you. Look, uh, th thank you for that. One million jobs in five years was always going to be a difficult task. <coughs> we had hoped that we could get on with that task immediately, and that is why we said within the first week of the Parliament sitting, we would be moving to get rid of the carbon tax and the mining tax. Uh, regrettably, they are still in play, and uh, my hunch is they will continue to be in play at least until the 1st of July. As a result, that has put our job-growing policies on hold because we can't implement them, courtesy of the Senate, which is, if I might say, extremely frustrating. How can you help in creating jobs? Well, if I might say, you, your task is to run good, viable, sustainable businesses. And it is only then that you will grow your employment pool. We don't expect you to be a charitable organisation employing people for the sake of employing people, which then prejudices your viability. So therefore, our task as a government is to get out of your way and to create the environment. And so when we say we want to create a million jobs in five years, can I say that should have one of those asterisks you know, that some of the financial services have to have on their advertisements? Yeah, we, because at the end of the day, if we as a government create jobs, the only place where we create jobs is in the public service. Our task is to create the environment which then allows you, the business community, to uh, create the actual jobs. In relation to youth unemployment, can I say that is a scourge that this nation does need to face. There are areas, uh, I'm sure in Queensland as well, but North Adelaide, 40% youth unemployment. Some terrible statistics in my own home state of Tasmania as well. And uh, that is why some of us do um, grimace somewhat when we do see the independent umpire, the Fair Work Commission, deciding to increase youth wages and increase the wages of uh, apprentices. Because given that huge pool of young people desperately wanting employment and to get a start in life, one wonders what the impact of those increases will be on their employability and on businesses deciding whether or not to employ young people. And what we also need to do, if I might say, is have a look at the welfare system, and all I would say is watch this space, but it seems to me that if there are young people 
that have the capacity to work, then they have an obligation to undertake that work and that is why we are committed to work for the dole and we'll be seeking to reintroduce that as soon as, uh, as we are able to. And speaking of businesses, could I ask a quick question on behalf of the room about the distinction between big business and small business? In terms of the changes you've talked about today, do you see a distinction in the benefit uh, as opposed to uh, big business versus medium to smaller businesses? In general terms, I am told, and the statistics they tell me bears this out, is that the employment engine room is in fact in small business. That is where there is the greatest growth of employment and in fact it has been the bigger employers, be it car manufacturers, be it an airline company, be it an oil company, etc., that seem to be shedding jobs and the growth potential seems to be more in uh, the small business sector. But look, having said that, absolutely not fussy and we want jobs to grow everywhere and anywhere they might be available and that is why, for example, our Greenfields policy, clearly designed for big business, big resource projects on the one hand, and our changes with a Fair Work Ombudsman producing a document to assist small business to employ their first person is designed to assist the small business sector. So we look everywhere for the opportunity for employment for our fellow Australians, uh, but at the moment I am told that the richest vein to mine is in fact the small business sector. I can see that your lunch has arrived, so maybe time for one medium question or two quick ones. Yes, hello Senator, Senator Jarrett Goose from Downer Mining. Um, just two comments I guess. Uh, one comment is um, in relation to uh, the social activism of the Fair Work Commission um, recently in making decisions which effectively uh, limit uh, urine testing on mine workers. Uh, that's obviously of, of great concern to our industry. Uh, the other issue also is just goes generally to agreements and uh, matters like um, the payment of annual leave on termination where those are written into contracts uh, and there's been a recent um, New South Wales District Court decision saying that despite what's written into agreements approved by the Commission, uh, annual leave must be paid out at the rate that it would otherwise have been paid out during employment. Are you concerned about the activism of uh, the District Courts and the Fair Work Commission? I'm not aware of that particular District Court decision, so I'll have to catch up on that one, but uh, I make no bones about the fact that uh, I believe that in general terms the conservative way is the best way for government and, if I might say, the judiciary uh, to behave, and that is why uh, I personally favour black letter lawyers those that read the law and then implement it rather than saying what do I want the law to be and then trying to juggle the words to try to get the outcome they want to achieve. Uh, I hope I'm not being uh, too discourteous to uh, the men and women on the bench uh, before whom I used to appear uh, some years ago. But I think uh, the point you make uh, is a valid point and a number of people have expressed concern and uh, the tasteful topic that you raised over lunch of your own testing, uh, the, difficulty, the difficulty that the resource sector has, and whilst it might be funny, it's not if you're in the sector, you've had two full benches of the Fair Work Commission, three makes a full bench, coming down with diametrically opposed positions. So if you are a lawyer seeking to advise a resource sector company, can you or can't you, Basically, it's a flick of the coin. And if I might say, and I haven't touched on this in my speech, uh, it was decisions such as that that motivated us to put into our policy the consideration of an appeals body sitting on top of the Fair Work Commission with suitably qualified individuals so that there would be a degree of consistency and a following of precedence to provide the certainty that businesses need and we are still in the process of determining whether or not we go down that track. I'm very conscious of your lunch getting cold. Can we make this a really quick one, please? Peggy from Peninsula Eye Hospital. Do you have any plans to redefine what is a small, medium and large business? Well, the toughest one kept till last, 
Uh, the Fair Work Act uh, refers to uh, small businesses as being those businesses with 15, and uh, that is a head count for the purposes of uh, the unfair dismissal law, and uh, nothing in our proposed uh, changes that we took to the last election would change that. But uh, it is interesting when you talk to people what people think is a small business, a medium and a large business. If I might say, uh, with a bit of self-reflection, when the Howard government sought to assert that a business that had 100 full-time equivalent employees was a small business, if I might say, that did not pass the pub test. Most people thought, no, that is not a small business. They usually think of a small business of being sort of round about the two dozen mark. But look, are we going to be uh, changing the law in that regard? Uh, at this stage, no, unless uh, some strong advocacy is undertaken for the need for that. And even if there is that strong advocacy, as we said in our policy, we won't be making any changes without taking that to the next election. Ladies thank you and very gentlemen, much. enjoy your lunch. We'll be back shortly. Please thank Senator Eric Abetz. <laughs>
Um, as a country, we need to address these things if we're going to head in the direction we need to. It's small business that provides the livelihood to individuals. It creates uh, community prosperity and societal wellbeing. And they do that through offering secure ongoing employment and a livelihood. And we really need to be ensuring that the Fair Work Act doesn't impede what is in the main a really rewarding uh, responsibility of actually employing individuals. We're in the tourism and hospitality industry, part of the services sector. We're providing services not just to visitors but to residents as well, 24 hours, seven days a week. We have seen over the last few years the industrial relations systems going in the opposite way of a flexible system that allows us to operate on those terms. And uh, the, the, probably the greatest insult to us was the uh, perversely named modern award system that uh, took us backwards from our industry's point of view and actually made it harder for us to capture the opportunities that clearly tourism and hospitality offers, not just in this state but nationally, and we want to see a rebalancing of that. Nick, uh, I asked uh, Senator Rebetz to distinguish between big business and small business in terms of the, the benefits that could flow from the, the changes the government has in mind. Did you like his answer? I think that the problem with the Fair Work Act for small business is that it treats the majority of small businesses who do do the right thing by their employees as the worst of employers um, who unfortunately do not. Um, there's some interesting statistics up on the slides that we're putting together and, you know, two-thirds of, of small businesses in Queensland actually think that um, the Fair Work Act is skewed too far in favour of the employee and certainly 70% uh, think that um, the Fair Work Act doesn't take into account the unique circumstances of small business. And small business has a, a right, I guess, to manage the performance of its employees um, and that managerial prerogative shouldn't um, you know, entail the, the payment of go-away money uh, and certainly we would believe that unfair dismissal uh, exemption is appropriate for small business and at 15 employees at this point in time, well, we would obviously be encouraging um, the federal government um, through the Productivity Commission inquiry to hopefully lift that exemption threshold up to about 49 employees. Ladies and gentlemen, over to you. Anybody like to kick off the discussion? Hello. Craig Shaw from Queensland Airports. Just a question in relation to the current restructuring of the, the economy and I guess the transmission of business requirements. I see a number of people who are displaced from their current roles and are looking to transition into different roles. Uh, what's your views in relation to the, I guess, the challenges presented from transmission of business where those people need to bring their conditions potentially with them where we may perhaps not want that to occur? Thanks, Dan. Um, I think we can fairly say that in 2009 there was a significant change to the way that worked. Um, it used to be that if somebody transferred from one bus business to another, assets had to move across and so forth and there was a limit on how long that transfer occurred. Um, however, um, that was opened up and now if there's any movement of the roles across, you've got an, a, an indefinite um, situation where those terms and conditions come across. And unfortunately, if they've come across from somewhere that was paying more generous terms and conditions, then it may well even apply to new employees in the, in the entity that they've moved across into. Um, I, I've noted that in the uh, Fair Work Amendment Bill that that uh, the government has put forward. They are looking to provide an opportunity where an employee requests to make that move, that you can be exempt from those um, conditions and not bring those instruments with you. I think that's a great step forward because at least it provides an opportunity for people to take on those new roles and not um, disturb the environment with, uh, with conditions that may not have been sustainable in the company in the first place, which was probably why they're no longer in business. So I think there's a, certainly a movement in the right direction. Gentlemen, any further thoughts? Okay. Yes, sir.
<laughs> well, maybe the senator should answer that question, but uh, <laughs> wait. Yes, I was wait. predicting he was going to storm the stage. I didn't uh, expect him to storm the table next to him. <laughs> but what I, what I would say, though, is that obviously apart from the Fair Act review, which is currently in process, has just started now, we're obviously also looking to the Productivity Commission work, which is hopefully giving us a bit of a more comprehensive assessment, and out of that will hopefully come new policy initiatives and possibly legislative changes as a result of the far more com comprehensive and broader ranging uh, assessment that uh, the Productivity Commission will undertake. And I'm sure all the businesses here, and certainly the industry associations here, will make very strong representations to the, to the Productivity Commission on these broader issues. The, the Senator certainly um, you know, extensively discussed the issue of unions in, in the workplace um, and you know, the, the comments about uh, unfair dismissal exemption uh, for small business. But there's two other major areas where we perhaps haven't yet focused our energies. And, and when we talk to Queensland businesses, um, one of their significant concerns uh, relates to the actual overall labour cost base that, uh, that underpins the system. Oh. Now, if you look at the last several decisions of the Fair Work Commission, it's actually increased the minimum wage by about $4,070. Um, that puts Australia as having the highest minimum wage in the OECD. Um, that, those increases are certainly well above um, CPI increases and productivity measure increases over the same period. Uh, and there's actually an astonishing figure where um, every time we're in the media saying that these numbers uh, threaten the viability of business. What I actually do, the Australian Business Counts um, data actually indicates that approximately each year 63,000 Queensland businesses cease to trade. So there's no doubt that the overall um, labour costs of, of the industrial relations framework are impeding business. Um, but you also couple it with other things like the federal government increasing the superannuation guarantee from, from 9 to 12 per cent. Um, yes, we do have to ensure that we have appropriate retirement incomes for the future, but we don't believe that it is an employer responsibility solely to achieve that outcome. Ultimately, individuals have to embrace their own responsibilities in that area. But you've also got a Fair Work Commission which is um, seeking to phase out junior rates of pay for in the retail sector. You've got the Fair Work Commission that has increased the cost of engaging first and second year apprentices and trainees. So it's really becoming increasingly difficult for employers to provide that entry into the workplace um, that is so vitally needed. And so we discussed um, the youth unemployment rates across Australia and certainly the Fair Work Commission is not stepping up in that regard. Now to fix, um, well we don't want to race to the bottom in terms of wages, but um, one of the fixes is through uh, flexible working arrangements and again there needs to be energies focused in that area. Now there's, there's a spectrum of solutions. You can be really aggressive and introduce uh, individual statutory agreements again or you can do things such as extending the IFAs out to 13 weeks which the coalition has encouraged done. Ultimately we think those IFAs need to become a condition of employment and that you should be able to negotiate remuneration aspects um, under a better off overall uh, framework. Mark Valise, Three MRSO Job Access. I run our UK operations. And what I've noticed, I've been there the last five years, is that our current unemployment rate uh, is the envy of the world. When I look forward in a few years, I would expect it to be back to 5%. What can we do in the future to help when we're only at 5% back to those 4.5%? Because this current government has produced those results in the past. So I'm looking more further ahead what are we going to do in Australia? Because we are the envy of the world in what we're doing right now. Well, what we can do is grab the opportunities that clearly lie before us. And certainly the Deloitte Access Economic Report recently highlighted a few areas where Australia is very strong in, uh, in view of the position that we have with, the, with the Asia Pacific. Tourism happens to be one of them. Um, we can grab those opportunities, but only if we do the kind of things that Nick's talking about, making it easy for businesses to actually viably trade and expand and mar are 
add at the margin to the employment that they have in their small businesses very often. We've seen a strong trend over the last two years. The, uh, uh, the, f the federal statistics tell us that we've had in our sector alone 20, 000, more than 20,000 employees over the last two years. The opportunities are far greater. We know we can grow, not just our sector, but we can grow other sectors to make up for some of the losses in the resource uh, sector currently. We can do that. We can more than compensate for those losses, but we have to provide the encouraging environment for employers to employ young people and people who want to re-enter the workforce, mature workers, with the flexibility, and that's the key word, with the flexibility that allows all these people who have these particular needs, uh, uh, lifestyles that are not necessarily s s to be squeezed into this nine to seven uh, framework that we are uh, lumbered with, if we give that flexibility, then many small businesses will be able to expand their workforce and we'll, we will have a, a greater workforce globally with a lower unemployment rate. I have no doubt about that. The Senator very aptly described what is the actual role of government and, and it was really pleasing hearing the words and that the role of government isn't to act as an employer, the, the role of the government is to enable a business operating environment that, that enables business to, to grow and to employ and you know they can do that through taxation settings, regulatory settings, uh, influencing policies on the cost of energy um, but also policies in the area of workplace relations. Now as an organisation that seeks to represent business, um, it can be very challenging uh, seeking to put in place a, a framework that will, that will change um, uh, workplace relations settings. But at the moment, um, we don't have much faith with the Fair Work Commission and working within the confines of the Fair Work Commission to realise the change that we think is necessary. Um, nevertheless, we will appear before the Fair Work Commission on issues such as the annual wage review, on the review of modern awards, but generally, um, you know, business indicates that they're frustrated with the Fair Work Commission. They're certainly frustrated with the previous federal government who have loaded the Commission with individuals from the union movement, and they really don't feel that they're getting a fair hearing from the Fair Work Commission at present. Um, you know, 41% of businesses are dissatisfied with the Commission at the moment in their handling of unfair dismissals. Another 40% are dissatisfied with the Commission uh, in their handling of industrial action. And, and, two, and a third of businesses are unhappy with their, um, their handling of enterprise agreements and bargaining generally. So we don't hold much faith in actually realising change through that process, but nevertheless have to be engaged with that process um, to earn the right to talk about these issues. We see our role I guess is really um, encouraging the public to, to be understanding of the issues that need to, that need to be changed. Uh, and that way, through public support, the, uh, the, the, the federal government will be empowered to actually make those changes, whether it be short-term changes that the senator's already extensively spoken about, or the longer-term changes that, um, that will hopefully be realised through the Productivity Commission inquiry and uh, you know, policies being taken into the next federal election. Theresa, speaking of the Fair Work Commission, can you talk to us for a minute about some of their recent decisions in relation to workplace bullying? Yeah, we have seen some interesting um, things happen in the world of workplace bullying. Uh, the jurisdiction only started on the 1st of January. Um, it doesn't affect um, small businesses or um, the state government employees. It does affect all constitutional corporations. Um, certainly, uh, the first decisions, I think, there's a recognition within the Commission that the decisions they make will have a, uh, a fairly um, unforgiving bearing on all of the other decisions that follow. So the first decision we saw come through um, that was taken from a Commissioner and a full bench was formed, and that was looking at whether or not bullying that had occurred prior to the 1st of January should be allowed to be considered. Um, and there was an argument put that it shouldn't. Um, and there were, of course, arguments by the unions put that it should, and the decision of the full bench was that it should um, be taken into consideration. We saw a number of uh, bullying matters that were um, tossed out by the Fair Work Commission, and it appeared that it was because the employee that had made the um, complaint had then not followed it up. The Commission had asked questions, sought more information, and that hadn't occurred. So no doubt, just going through that process would have caused a lot of work and angst for the parties involved, and it didn't really end with any potential outcome. 
Um, and we have seen more recently one of the unions apply and, and make an application on behalf of employees, which wasn't anticipated, I suspect, when the legislation was put forward and a full bench was convened and we were waiting to see which way they decided and the union decided that they didn't have a strong enough case and withdrew, so we didn't get to see the outcome of that. So I think we'll continue to see that area evolve. There was an order made um, to stop bullying, the first bullying orders we saw come through, and in that particular case, um, the part, there was parties restrained from what time they could come to work, restrained from who they couldn't talk to while they were at work, and certain other activities. Now that causes me some grave concerns particularly when you've got smaller organisations who may be constitutional corporations, that you've now got the Commission effectively making decisions that restrain civil rights and behaviours of people in the workplace from an individual's perspective, but from an employer's perspective, you've got an external party coming in and telling you how your work's going to run, how your staff are going to interact, what time they can come to work, what duties they can do to interact with other people. And I can imagine that that would be um, not something, as a business owner, that I would like to see happen within my business. Who's next, please? Yes. Hello, uh, Rodney Chappello, uh, part of the McDonald's team. Uh, last year there was a uh, renegotiation of a, of a deal and uh, the result was a 4.2% just based on base staff, not management, not the on cost, everything else, 4.2% increase in labour cost across the full P&L, gargantuan. We're now, we're now um, and, and my job is to grow and protect sales and jobs. That's it, that's, that's my whole focus. We have a broad range of um, life experience, so some young, and in, in my particular business, that's all I can talk about, uh, plus older folk as well, that add good value to customer service. With this significant increase, which was done, done in three tranches, one to come in July, we've had an increase in price, a decrease in customer count, um, some question now about how we you know, continue to employ older people. Um, we have this one tranche to go. How do we renegotiate that last one and say, you know what, can't do it, customer can't afford it, we can't afford it, our, our beautiful, wonderful staff can't afford the consequences of it. How can we renegotiate something like that that's already been done and approved by Fair Work Australia? How can we do that? I think we've got a fundamental problem with our um, bargaining system right now and, and I'm hoping it's something that the Productivity Commission does look at. When, if you go back to when bargaining first came into play, it was about organisations sitting down, employees sitting down and looking for ways to do things better, to do things in a more cost-effective cost way, to have greater productivity outcomes, to have greater quality outcomes and the pay increase was the reward for, for making those improvements. And what we've seen happen over time is that there is no longer a discussion about what might, you might be able to achieve to, get, to continue to make productivity gains and do things in a better way. And it's more about just, let's just keep it how it is now, but can you give me a pay increase? And it needs to be above CPI. Um, in an ideal world, I'd like to see that you can't pay an increase above CPI unless you can demonstrate and calculate and show the Fair Work Commission that you can make those savings or you can get some other benefit for the employer. I mean, we have a boot test to make sure that the employees know worse off. Why can't we have a boot test that makes sure the employers know worse off? I think there needs to be a fundamental relook at how we go about the bargaining process because the way it began is not the way it is now and we can't continue those kinds of outcomes. Um, if you look at We've had a number of fairly large manufacturers who've not been able to compete. They've had to close down. We just had the BP Bulwa refinery here and make an announcement not long ago that they are going to have to shut down. We're no longer isolated from the west, rest of the world. We're part of the global economy. We can't hide from it and we need to be competitive in the way we go about dealing with our, the way we remunerate our employees. Can I just add, you know, the scenario you described from McDonald's, 
is repeated in thousands of small businesses who have even less market power than you do, and they are confronted with these consequences in a very, very harsh uh, global and competitive environment, and they struggle with exactly the same thing that you described. And, uh, and if it's a problem for McDonald's, then I can assure you it's an even bigger problem for many of the small businesses who have to deal with the same type of scenario. The, <coughs> the unions do say they're very concerned about any move on, on penalty rates, which is a, obviously a, a touchy issue in the, in the tourism sector. Um, do, do the unions have a right to be concerned in that respect? Well, the unions uh, have a right to, to voice an opinion, but I think the unions too have an interest in ensuring that there is employment in the first instance and that there are actually jobs for the current employees and also the ones that are still looking for a job. And that's certainly not going to be helped by a restrictive environment that imposes penalty rates that are not commensurate with either the, uh, the, 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 the social environment that we have created with the expectation of service at the uh, hours outside what is now considered normal working hours. And it's uh, certainly not commensurate with the commercial environment that we confront. And we are, most of us, all of us, I suppose, are in a global competitive market and we have to be able to compete. So is, is it a situation where a, a job is, a, a job at any rate is better than no job at all? Did they, I, I think the unions would say that the, it, you should pay a, a low paid worker, especially at the, the lower end of the scale, you know, that, that should be taken into account. Or, or you, is your argument that it's better to have that than, than no job at all? Well, within, within limits, I mean, I don't think anybody in our industry wants to see uh, the slave labor. That's certainly not the outcome that anyone strives for. We, we rely on employees, including the ones who are serving us lunch here today, that are actually happy to do the job. We want people who are committed to their job. But uh, we find that many uh, willing employees are now prevented from working the hours that they actually would like to work because the employer can simply not afford to employ them at those times and as a consequence reduces the service or closes the business altogether on public holidays or on that perhaps on the weekend or uh, late at night. And the, the consequence is indeed that there is less work or, and fewer jobs. So it's not about uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of, of people without power in the marketplace who are looking for a job. That's certainly not what our industry wants, but we want to have the flexibility to, uh, to engage with our employee and prospective employees to give them a job when there is work. So Chris, if I could follow that up, I mean, we, we really do have a, a crazy situation now where um, businesses are choosing not to open on Sundays and statutory holidays, and they're not opening, um, their customers are miffed, uh, and employees aren't earning any wages. So no one's winning under that scenario, and, and the Senator may recall that CSIQ facilitated uh, a number of restaurateurs from Hastings Street and Gympie Terrace up in Noosa um, to talk about their experience with penalty rates and, and Easter. And the vast majority of those restaurants were choosing to close on Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. And you know, next Friday marks a, a, a very difficult period for um, many businesses where you're going to have penalty rates apply for Good Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, then the following Friday is Anzac Day and then you have the penalty rates applying on uh, Saturday and Sunday again. So seven of ten days, uh, businesses are going to have the challenge of trying to pay penalty rates and earn sufficient revenue to actually warrant opening their doors. And unfortunately, many businesses will exercise their right not to open and no one, no one is benefiting uh, under that scenario, particularly in a state like Queensland where we pride ourselves on our tourism offering and uh, you know, the population of Brisbane is travelling the Noosa and nothing's open. So, so what's the solution? Because presumably workers do deserve penalty rates if they work. You know, it's, it's the, there's an unfortunate coincidence of the calendar there. But So what, what's the solution? It should, should there be a, a more even system of rates? Well, very, very pleasingly, um, CSIQ and, and QTIC uh, are being very proactive in trying to get a consensus position across the industry. And we're at one on the, the fact that penalty rates is imposing an enormous problem but we're also going to try and have a consensus position on what needs to change. Now, there's, again, there's a spectrum of recommendations that you can make here, um, you know, based on you know, changing the loadings on a given day through to um, the treatment of the first five shifts each week being penalty rate, rate free, and then the shifts six and seven and beyond would be those shifts that would attract penalty rates. So we want to continue to reward the employee if they work long hours and, and on, um, you know, um, you know long hours each week, 
but uh, at the same time we believe that employers and businesses should be afforded some flexibility to juggle their ros rostering arrangements um, to enable that to occur and, and Daniel may wish to um, talk about some of the research that we're bringing to the table. Yeah, we are uh, fortunate that the uh, uh, Department of Justice and Attorney General is also interested in this issue, not necessarily in, advoca in advocating on, on our behalf, but certainly researching it. And we are looking, uh, at, in the first instance, at what constitute, uh, constitutes an unsociable hour, when is unsociable. You know, we don't all go to church anymore on a Sunday and all cease doing anything other than sitting around with the family. People expect to go out, be active, engage in other activities that has implications for what is considered a penalty rate worthy time. And we have to adjust our, underst our uh, understanding with the, uh, the, the industrial relations system. So that's a piece of research that we're looking into to understand what is appropriate. When should a penalty rate be paid? And under what circumstances and, and at what level? And we're similarly, and a more uh, comprehensive piece of research we're doing to investigate just what is the impact of the current system on the employment levels, because not only anecdotally do we strongly believe that businesses close or, sh or, or don't open on these days, but also they reduce the employment levels. So a restaurant may decide to, uh, the owner may decide to not employ anybody on that day, but do it all themselves. And that of course has a similarly unfortunate impact on the employee who no longer has the hours to work and the uh, poor uh, unfortunate uh, employer is just working excessive hours and suffers as a consequence. We might have time for one more. Noel Hammers. Noel Hammers, my name, past chairman of the Australasian Bowling Club Association. I guess what I'm saying is going to be what you've already answered, but uh, we used to have a very, very good award. Uh, we negotiated with the AWU over a couple of years, and when it was ratified, it was a uh, congratulated to us by the, uh, the chairman of the commission. When the uh, modernisation of the awards came in, that was just wiped out and uh, we were just placed in a uh, group with zoos, etc., which, of course, aren't appropriate to what we do. How can we, hopefully, lobby to get some of these specialised awards back in? Because what you're talking about now is penalty rates and different times. We experienced that 15 years ago when we started working to get the, a decent award which covered our industry, which runs seven days a week, 16 hours a day, 364 days a year. We desperately need to get it back because what you're saying is exactly what's happened now. Some days it is completely unviable for us to operate and that result is we either have a junior with management and that's what happens. And people who experienced good work relations with us, especially we had a lot of working mums who would like to work a Saturday or a Sunday to give themselves some pocket money for the following week, they don't get a job anymore. We really do need to hopefully get our award, can we possibly get our award through a bit of lobbying so we can have it the successful way we operated you know, a few years ago when we changed the modernisation. Thank you. Who'd like to take that one? I, I think um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one because in the current um, environment, legislative environment that we have, um, there isn't a lot of room to move. But certainly some of the options that Daniel and Nick are, are talking about now, looking at um, how we structure penalties, um, perhaps having those first few shifts where, there, where there's no penalty, that, that might be something that, that we need to look at and, uh, ho and hopefully the Productivity Commission review will do so. There are mums who want to work on weekends and not during the week for some pocket money, but there's also university students who want to be able to work on the weekend and earn some money while they're at uni during the week. Um, and they're missing out on shifts too because restaurants and, and so forth are just not opening. So I think it's, it's something for the Productivity Commission hopefully to look at. I think it's, it's a very difficult position for the coalition to be in because we would all like a lot more change. There is no doubt about that. Um, but there is no point in getting all of that change if then we have this huge movement um, in the population that says, hey, that's too much and this government's too radical and we're going to get them out and instead have another government who's going to come in and be radical in the other direction. I think at the end of the day, we need to have a balanced approach. One of the things that strikes me about the Australian system in comparison to some of the others in the world is ours changes so much, so regularly. There's you know, significant shifts when there's changes in government. There's shifts, significant shifts during terms of government. Um, I was uh, quite stunned to learn that in the US they've had the same 
legislation since the 1940s, apart from a, some minor changes a couple of years after it came in. Um, that kind of stability and certainty is a good thing for business, but to reach that we need to get some balance in the system that's fair on both sides. And I think that, I, you know, that that's where we need to head. And, and, and the other thing I'd say is we are so heavily regulated, um, if not the most regulated um, employment framework in the world, um, we need to back away from that. I think a balanced system shouldn't have so much regulation. Um, the Senator talked about letting businesses get on and manage and not um, interfering, and I think that's the way it needs to be, and perhaps that's where the balance might fall, somewhere in the middle. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Teresa Moltoni, Nick Behrens, and Daniel Gishvin. And could I ask you one more time to thank our special guest today, Senator Erica Betts. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Queensland Tourism Industry Council, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate you being with us. Hope you've had a great time and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.